Hi, this is Ms. Fitzmorris, and this video is about thermal equilibrium. So by the end of this video, you should be able to describe how objects reach thermal equilibrium on the microscopic level. Um, you should be able to explain the equation sigma qi equals zero, okay, and what that equation means, where it comes from. And you should also be able to solve problems in which two objects come to thermal equilibrium with each other. That is, one is hot, one is cold, and by the end they come to be the same temperature. Alright, and just a quick recap from Friday. Um, thermal equilibrium, temperature, and heat. So thermal equilibrium is when two objects, or two or more objects, um, they come to reach the same temperature. So the correct way to use thermal equilibrium is that objects are in thermal equilibrium with each other, um, and they've reached the same constant temperature. So you take a cold glass of milk out of the fridge. Originally, it's colder than the air temperature. It will reach thermal equilibrium with the room once it is warmed up to exactly the same temperature of the room. The room will lose a little tiny bit of temperature and be in thermal equilibrium with the cold milk. Alright, remember temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules within an object. Okay, and this is different than heat because heat is the energy gained or lost um, from an object through a phase change, temperature change, or some kind of force like friction or air resistance. Okay, so don't write this down if you already have them in your notes, which you should from Friday, but remember the two key differences between temperature and heat, that temperature is how much energy something has, heat is how much energy it's gaining or losing. All right, so as I said, the first thing we're going to talk about is how objects come into thermal equilibrium with one another. And to talk about this, we're going to use an example. All right, so in this first example, we have hot water. Um, we have 100 grams of it at 90 degrees C. And we're going to mix it with some cold water, which is also 100 grams, and at 10 degrees C, let's say that we put it inside of a container that's like a thermos, okay, so it's covered, no heat is going to get in or out of the container, so just these two things are mixing. We have 200 grams of water at the end, but we want to know what is the final temperature, and we also want to know how it is that these two things mix and eventually have the same final temperature. So what I want you to do is I want you to copy down these four questions and try to answer them for yourself. Okay, then you can check back for the answers. Then I want you to first describe the microscopic difference between the two waters before they're mixed. I want you to describe what you think happens to the cold water molecules after they mix. Describe what you think happens to the hot water molecules after they mix. And I want you to tell me, do you think the total thermal energy is conserved? So does the total amount of thermal energy, if I added up the kinetic energy of each individual molecule, um, will that be the same or different after the two waters mix? All right, so now that you've taken a moment to answer these questions, we're going to go over the answers. Okay, so the difference between the two waters before they mix is that the hot water, the molecules are moving really quickly. Each molecule has a lot of kinetic energy, and for the cold water, the molecules are moving slowly, and each molecule does not have as much kinetic energy. And I just wrote quickly twice, but I meant slowly the second time. Now, when 
the cold water molecules are exposed to hot water molecules, what happens is the cold slow molecules are hit or collide with fast molecules and as a result they speed up. Okay, now with the hot water molecules, they were moving quickly at the beginning, and so the hot, fast molecules they are hit by slow molecules and they actually slow down. Now, my last question is, is the total thermal energy conserved? And the answer is actually yes. Okay, so if you look at these two, or these three bottles, I guess, we have a certain amount of energy at the beginning for each bottle. At the end, we've combined the two, our energy hasn't been able to go anywhere, it's just mixing and kind of redistributing with the molecules. So the slow molecules, they gain kinetic energy, they get faster, the fast molecules, they lose kinetic energy and they get slower, but at the end we still have the same amount of total energy. Okay, so if we think about that in terms of heat, okay, the hot water it loses energy, okay, and so it will have a negative Q, a negative heat, remember that heat is Q. The cold water, it's going to gain energy, and it will have a positive Q, remember Q, our heat is just a change in energy, but the change in energy overall if we add this negative plus this positive, you could imagine there's no total change. Okay, and this brings us to a general rule. Okay, when objects in a closed system, and by that right now, just think about a thermos. No heat's able to escape or come in reach thermal equilibrium, and I'm just going to abbreviate equilibrium with EQ, some objects lose energy, some gain, but kind of like in energy before where we had sigma E naught equals sigma E, the total stays the same. And what that means for heat is that if we add up all the heats, so remember heat is a change in energy, and remember the sigma means sum, we're adding up all the heats, and I is just, you know, which heat we're dealing with for which object, we should get zero, okay? So some have a positive heat, some have a negative heat, but if we add up all of the heats, we should get zero. And using the th two equations, Q equals MC delta T, and Q equals ML, these two equations in combination with the fact that the total heat should be equal to zero will help us find the final temperature of a system.
Alright, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you another example. Um, and in this example, we'll be able to find the final temperature of some ice melting in warm water. And then I'm going to summarize the strategy for solving these types of problems. Alright, so here's the example. Um, we have 10 grams of ice at 0 degrees C and 100 grams of water at 25 degrees C. Um, obviously, these things, if they're put together, the ice is going to melt, and we're going to get 110 grams of water, and we want to know what the final temperature would be. So to think about this problem, we have to think about what's happening to the ice and what's happening to the water as they come into thermal equilibrium. Okay, so what I like to do is I like to, when I'm dealing with thermal equilibrium problems, list out my objects that are in contact with each other. So the ice is in contact with the water. Okay, and I like to list out what's happening to each one. And so first, the ice is melting. And so it's gaining energy, and that's going to be a positive heat. And because it's a phase change, I'm going to use Q equals ML for that. Then, once the ice has melted, it's going to change temperature, and it's going to go from 0 degrees, which it is once it melts, to whatever that final temperature is. Now, again, that's a positive heat because it's gaining energy, but it's a temperature change, so we're going to be using Q equals MC delta T. Now, the water, it is going from 25 degrees C to the final temperature, whatever that final temperature may be, and it's losing heat, so that's going to be, because it's a temperature change, Q equals MC delta T again. Okay, and what I've listed up here is C, the specific heat of water, and L, the latent heat of ice. And to find the final temperature, I'm going to use this idea that if I add up all of my heats, I should get zero. So I have sigma Q equals zero. And I'll add up all my individual heats. So I have Q, and I'm just going to abbreviate it, Q melt, okay, plus Q, the heat from the water raising its temperature from zero to T, plus Q of the water going from 25 to T. And those three things have to be equal to zero. Now I'm going to continue this on the next page. Okay, and so I've rewritten my summation. And I'm going to plug in the individual formulas for my heats. Now I look back and I've already listed them out for myself. Okay, these are the equations I'm going to use to fill in the individual heats. Alright, so Q melting. I'm going to use Q equals ML. And remember, it's only the ice that's melting. So I'm using only the mass of the ice and L of ice. Okay, that ice becomes water and then it changes temperature. And I'm going to use MC delta T, but it's still only the mass of that ice that became water. And then again, I'm going to use MC delta T, but this is going to be the original water. So M of my original water times C times my temperature change. And this is from 0 to T, this temperature change, and this is from 25 to T. Okay, so now I can start filling numbers in. I know that the mass of my ice is 10, 
and L ice is 334 joules. All right, and I know that, again, the mass of the ice is 10. I know that C is 4.18, and my delta T, it's final minus initial, so the final is that temperature we're looking for minus zero. Okay, finally, plus the mass of the water, which was 100 times 4.18, which is the specific heat of water, and then final minus initial, so this is going to be T minus 25, and this is all equal to zero. All right, so we can go ahead and do out the algebra. We have 10 times 334, which is 340, um, plus 10 times 4.81, which is 41.8t, because t minus 0 is just t, and then plus 100 times 4.81, which is 418t minus 25. Now there are a couple ways that you could go about finding the final answer. Um, my preferred way is to first distribute this 418 to both of the things inside of the parentheses and then try to collect like terms. All right, so when we do that, we still have 3340 plus 41.8t. Okay, those two don't change. And then we have plus 418t and minus 418 times 25, which is 10,450 equals 0. Now we want to combine like terms. So I'm going to combine my t's. I have 41.8t plus 418. And so when I do that, I get 450, oops, 459.8t. And then I have 3340 minus 104050, and I get minus 700 or 7110 is equal to zero. Now I have to get the t by itself. So first I add 710 or 700,110 to both sides. And I end up with 459.8t equals 7110. I then divide both sides by 459.8. And when I do that, I find that the final temperature is equal to. 15.46 degrees C. All right, so just to summarize the steps that I went through. Of course, as always, you're going to read the whole problem. Um, after that, you're going to make a list of the objects coming into thermal equilibrium with one another. So in our last case, it was the water and the ice cube. Then you're going to describe or list the physical changes each of these objects undergo. And by physical changes, all we mean is either a temperature change or a phase change. Okay, remember phase change is when something goes from solid to liquid, liquid to gas, gas to liquid, or solid to gas. Then, for each change your objects undergo, so melting or changing temperature, you want to figure out 
whether your object gains or loses, and that would be a minus, heat for each change, and also find the associated equation. So the associated equations could either be Q equals ML, or Q, our heat, is equal to MC delta T. Finally, you want to plug it into the equation sigma Q equals zero, so all the heats added up are equal to zero. And finally, plug in your numbers and solve.